A very good morning to you. My name is Daniel Wahome and welcome to Sports Check on this Monday morning. It is the first day of March 2021. Happy New Month to everyone and lots of conversation around sport. We're going to be talking about rugby. Competitive rugby is back for the Kenyan teams. That's at club level and an international level. And we'll be having a former Kenya Sevens coach and a person who's also played for Kenya Sevens, Felix Uchieng, to break down what was happening in Madrid and also in Nairobi. Nakuru and Kakamega. We should also be having a conversation about athletics because on Wednesday the Confederation of African Athletics made an announcement that the postponement of the Africa Cross Country Championships is on. Bartnaba Kurir, who is an uh, Athletics Kenya Executive Committee member, will be telling us all about it and also the calendar that's changing by the day. We shall also be having a conversation about football. Remember the KBC Channel 1 the entire family is your true sports partner. The CAF Under-20 Championship, the Africa Cup of Nations for that age group. We also had the CAF Champions League matches yesterday. And coming in the week, the DFB Pokal. So all that and more as we keep up with what's happening in the news, including the one story where the selection panel that was appointed by President Uhuru Kenyatta, and this is to appoint the chairperson and one commissioner of the Teachers Service Commission is getting to work this morning. And this is at the Public Service Commission offices. So the panel that is going to be chaired by Mr. Thomas Coyier is going to be inaugurated officially this morning. That's at around 11 a.m. That's one of the stories that we are going to be following up on. And we get straight into a conversation and the first one's about rugby and they say rugby teaches character and a lot of character has had to be exhibited over the weekend. Shuja, they were in Spain uh, for the Madrid Sevens, played over two weekends. This weekend that came to a close and also on the weekend of the 20th and 21st of February. Shuja, that's the men's team, they won all the matches with the exception of those that they played against Argentina. Incidentally, they were the last matches at the round robin phase and also in the finals of those two tournaments and straight into conversation with Felix Uching and uh, Felix a very good morning to you and a good morning to you too and first overall this is the team that you've handled some of the players you've seen grow your take on Shuja at the Madrid Sevens. I think first of all we need to recognize the fact that a lot of these teams are getting back into into playing after a long year off because of COVID and the pandemic. So it was always going to be interesting with regards to their uh, results and, and how they're going to fare against opposition. I think everyone was trying to see where they're in terms of fitness, structures and everything. Um, in terms of consistency, obviously that was impressive to see that we're able to put back-to-back -back wins, you know, and play with, with, with some form of structure. And I think because a lot of players were also playing against each other, I mean with each other, you know, the players have just been brought in uh, by the head coach uh, Namco. So, what we see is that teams that were trying to gel with each other, and it was all the other teams, Portugal, Spain, USA, you know, mix and match after a whole year layoff, you know, coming back. So I think the consistency in performance was impressive, and there's a lot of learnings and improvements that we've seen going forward, and it was exciting, apart from the exception, which I think we'll talk about. <laughs> uh, later actually, we'll later. talk about Argentina in detail, yes, because that's exactly. a whole story by itself. But let's first of all look at uh, Saturday's results. 26-12 uh, against Portugal, yes. and this is our Portugal side that they played with a week before, and the result was 36-5. The difference in results? I think, first of all, you're playing five days apart. You know, you're playing one Saturday and another Saturday. It's always very, very difficult, also replicated in the World 7 Series, you know, to change and chop much during that time. And teams get to learn from each other, you know. So it's almost like you're playing this weekend, and then the next weekend you're back. So Portugal, obviously, have improved obviously and learned a few things in terms of there and that's why i'm saying it's important to note that the consistency in those wins against those other teams is what we need to be consistent about you know and that is actually what was happening and i think as you can see match fitness was improving there's no substitute for match fitness so the more you play the better you become as i think so i think in terms of the difference of the gaps it's just that you know what they've been in camp, they've been the same. Um, the coaches have analysed the other teams, you know, and, and I think we did enough and were consistent enough to still, you know, outplay them in the second round, despite the fact that the score was short, the gap was smaller. Spain was the exception. It's the one team that, you know, kind of gave Kenya a hard time yesterday, considering that the first match was 19-5. Uh, again, 19 points for Shuja uh, yesterday, but Spain 
seemed to be finding some ways around the team. Yeah, I think Spain for the longest time and obviously have been the most consistent team of also coming for Safari 7. So I think they know our terrain, they know our boys. And when you look at even the World 7 Series in 2019 and 2020, you know, Spain have always put up some amazing uh, performances and made it to a few um, quarterfinals. Um, in terms of their structures and what they're doing, Spain are always one of those teams where you don't give them opportunity. They play with a lot of passion, their levels of skill and their basics are very, very well. And they've always been it's just one of those teams that when Kenya Sevens plays, they always, almost can I say, they have our number. They always give us a hard time, but it was always important to come out with a win because they are pretty good side. Uh, let me talk about the U.S. And yeah. no, if you look at the, say, from the 2017 season, post the Olympics, let me put it that way, the United States have been knocking on the doors, you know, of trying to lift the series. But here was a U.S. side that Kenya beat twice. Yeah, I think for the US and, and Anna McFriday, he's never afraid of, of trying out new things or trying out new players or just starting from where he left off. Obviously, they've had a very, very good squad over the years. They've been very consistent. They are structures and they're a side who, as you've mentioned, you know, really, really, really have been consistent at the world level. And you mentioned knocking on the doors of even winning a series, you know, um, the year when Fiji just took it away from, from, from the jaws. Um, Basically, there, there are a lot of players who are now being given the opportunity to prove themselves in that squad. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of players who, who've been there before, you know, trying to show uh, positions of leadership. So for me, as you can see, I mean, the way USA was playing, obviously it's not a result that they wanted um, in terms of consistency, but I think they're going to learn from that. And, and I think they'll go back to the drawing board like everyone else and, 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 and come back better. So that's what, I, what I, that's what I believe. I mean, I think for Kenya also. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, for the USA, it's like, you know, these are the players you've been put in a position, you know, to represent and make that position yours, understand the processes and execute. So it's a great learning point. It'll be interesting to see how, what their team comprises of, you know, in, in the next warm-up tournament. Now, let's talk about Chile. This is a t uh, country that has got a very huge history when it comes to rugby um, in South America. They love the sport. Mm. They play it well. Your take on how they played um, in this was as an additional site for the second weekend of the Madrid Sevens. Yeah, I think the beauty about uh, Sevens, especially for countries like, you know, Chile, um, Spain, um, Brazil. Uruguay. Yeah, Uruguay. <laughs> I mean, they've really, really picked up the game and it has also increased the development of the sport in that region. And obviously, we would like to argue and say, you know, obviously coming from a very passionate and skillful level in terms of football, you know, it would be easy for them to transform into the game. So okay. Chile, is, they'll, they'll not fall, pa uh, fall short of passion they'll not fall short of excitement or short of taking up opportunities. I think where they fall short is that they just haven't played enough at that level and also in terms of building their strength level because it's all about strength as well at that particular level. So if you look at the Chileans and, and, and then teams like Uruguay, I think it's just a matter of how how well they they, 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 they they step up into them. And the more games they play, you know, the more we will be seeing them in various tournaments and putting up performances. So it's impressive to see the game, you know, spread into countries like Chile because it's good for the sport and it's good for the country. And it's good to keep it going. Now let's talk about Argentina. Four yeah. losses against Argentina. And if you were to consider this, that in this season, Argentina has stood out and their 15 side defeated New Zealand. It was a shock result, but let's look at their seven sides. What is it that they are doing right at this point in time? I think for, for Argentina, even coming from the backdrop of the World Seven Series just before the pandemic, I mean, they've, they've, I mean other than, than, than being excited in taking up their options, they've obviously very, 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 very consistent in their basics. All right, and that's one of their plays. In terms of open play, they're also one of those teams that keep the ball alive and take the opportunities when they're going. And it's one of those teams that never give up. If you see how they're playing, they never, never give up. You know, and credit to, to the coaching team for them to pick up from where they left and to come into these two, two tournaments at the Madrid Sevens and be consistent um, throughout. I mean, for the longest time, we know Argentina will always be a force to reckon with. You know, they've got a team and they are always also not afraid to experiment with young players and coming through and give them an opportunity. So it's exciting to see Argentina come through. Obviously, not at the expense of Kenya Sevens, <laughs> but obviously it was we, we, we were the track end of that. And I think they're also, for, um, for me as... as, as uh, as, 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 as a former Kenya Sevens coach, I think um, the management team are very analytical 
in terms of how they play the different teams. If you saw along both, mm -hmm. I think they, they, they play according to who they are playing and, and they seem to, to minimize their, their, their weaknesses and, and identify areas in which they take the opportunities. So I think that one they were very, very, we, 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 we fell short, unable to, to counter that um, for the number of games we played them over the seven days. And that would, that's, our, that's our worrying point. And I want to bring out something I, I noticed when it, when it comes to the Kenya Sevens team. And I will talk about two scenarios where there were, mall, uh, where there were malls. One was against um, Chile, and eventually the ball was stolen away, you know, right inside there. The second one is where you have about six Kenyan players against one Argentine player, and then he just did a basketball pass from inside the mall, and it was a try. How physical are our boys at the moment? As mentioned, it was, it was always going to be very, very exciting, you know, coming from a year where they haven't played in the competition. And, and I've mentioned before that it's very difficult to substitute much fitness. So what this tournament did, it allowed us and it allowed our team to gauge where they are physically and from a strength and conditioning point of view, to gauge where we are, you know, in terms of our endurance, you know, and, and obviously to gauge where we are in terms of that, that particular endurance over a period of 14 minutes. Now, in terms of strength, obviously, there are areas where I know they will come back and they know now that they need to work on. And then, obviously, with regards to their structures, many, many things went well. But obviously, the scenario that you're talking about, and happens quite a bit in, in rugby, is you know where you get into a situation where you overchase, you know, you all congregate towards the ball. So if that ball is moved away from a crowded space to an open space, then it leaves open on that side. So I think it's just a matter of the team and the players, you know, scanning and taking an opportunity to see where they're on the pitch and the responsibility of that person to ensure that the ball doesn't come out. Because if you chase the ball to one end, you have to ensure that the ball doesn't come out from that end or you either slow it down to allow your team. So I think that's one of the areas that we really needed to, to pick up, to stop over chasing the ball to the end. And if we get to that point, you know, make sure that the ball doesn't come out back into the open space. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's not that, um, it's one of those situations, and sevens is such a short game that you only have one opportunity to make the right kind of decisions, either in defense and attack. And that's just an, an, an example of where we did not make the right decision and resulted in, obviously, points for Argentina. How well is the team responding to defensive duties, you know, from the transition from attack to defense or from defense to attack? Yeah, I think that's, 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 that's obviously something interesting. It, it also has a lot to do with, um, with, 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 with the levels of fitness because with teams that are operating at that particular level, you know, like Argentina, who are shifting the ball very, very quickly, you know, between the set pieces, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I don't think all the players were at the same level in terms of that one, and you need all players to, to be able to transition more or less at the same or understand their structures and everything. So as I mentioned, it was a learning, you know, for them to be able to say, okay, fine, this is an area that hasn't worked out for us in terms of how we transition into from, 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 from attack or to defense. But at the same time, how do we ensure, you know, our one-on-one -on -one tackles and ball retention, we ensure that we keep it at where it is. So I saw a lot of areas that obviously we need imp improving. And I think, as mentioned, after a whole year out on the pandemic, I think the players then, the more they play together and train together, the more now they understand how to transition. And when you play different teams, different attack styles and everything, then you learn how to chop and change and how to gauge whether your, your structures on defense are working and whether we're transitioning quick enough. Obviously, there are examples like you noticed <laughs> that allowed other teams to get opportunities. And when you start bringing in other teams, you know, that are consistent in the World Series, it just means that we really now need to be a bit more sharp and a bit more decisive in making our decision. Now, I want you to mention three things from, um, from three perspectives. Number one, what needs to be retained uh, as far as the style of play is concerned, uh, what needs to be improved and what actually needs to be totally changed. So f the first one was what needs to be... <laughs> what needs to be retained? What do you keep? <laughs> what do we keep? Um, I think for me, our, 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 our ball carries, whether in and out of space, was, was very, very key. You know, we've got people who, when they got the gap, you know, they went as fast as possible. For what that meant is that we're using our physicality and our speed to get to the ball as far as possible into the field. And that obviously was drawing defenders. So, I mean, when we're able to retain three phases and the ball comes out, you know, 
it was very easy for us to, to push. And I think also in terms of how we were kicking, our kick also very, very good with Willie, you know, getting another ball. We're always putting other teams under pressure. I think also with USA. So those were very, very good um, from, from, from the lads in terms of kick. So that one we retain. The next one was what do we Improve. need to Improve. Oh, what do we need to... What you can say, this is going right, but it can get better. Okay, I think, despite the fact that with, with, with regards to, to the phases, you know, we're getting our phases in, but I think we can be more clinical in terms of our consistency, in terms of our basic, executing our basics. So if we take the ball in for a rack, we should ensure that the ball comes out and then our passes, you know, it should be, you know, it should be put into the space to where the players are. And I think that's one of the things that we're doing but we can do well in terms of our basics. I don't think we struggle with physicality and strength and everything, but if we're able to execute our basics better, whether it's our tackling, our passing, our, our rack attack or defense, then it means that we'll be a bit more consistent in drawing in defenders and putting our players in space. And finally, what needs a hundred percent, what needs an overhaul, if you were to, from your coaching eyes? I see that players are finding themselves in a decision when they break, when the line break, there's always the temptation to offload. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, we had a lot of those opportunities because the fact that, you know, you break the line and they made the tackle, I mean, we've got big boys and, and, and people who are able to release their hands and some offloads didn't work, as you notice. Yes. Um, it ended up in the opposition's hands. Personally, you know, for our kind of game, I would not make it a policy in terms of offloading. You know, I would rather um, formulate a policy where knowing when not to offload. You know, we should try and go as far as possible and knowing when not to offload. So we shouldn't go into a game saying, if I make a break, I should always try and toss the ball and look, because I've made a break, so I'm sure my players are behind. But it should be like, is this the best decision? to offload at this point, or should I just go as far as possible and then create a platform? Don't be Fiji. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah just, just, just play. And I think the players will be able to make a decision when not to offload. I'm not saying when to offload, because mm -hmm. everyone will know, they'll know when to. Mm -hmm. But they'll get into a position where, listen, I'm, I'm in this position, let me consolidate, let me play inwards into the game. I am leg carry as much as possible, stay on my feet as much as possible until my team comes, and then we play, which speaks now to the phases, because the more we do that, it means that teams then have to transition quicker into defense, allowing us to use our, our players out wide, our speed in terms of that and our strength. Very well. Now, let's talk about the Kenya Lioness. We are speaking with uh, Felix Ochieng. He is a former coach of the Kenya National 7 side, Shuja. Kenya Lioness were also in Madrid. And on the weekend of the 20th and 21st, it was a weekend to forget. They played all their matches, and there were six teams involved. They did not win a single game. But this weekend, there was a whole change of results. 17-5 uh, that lost uh, to Russia, but they defeated Spain 22-0 and Poland 12 uh, defeated Kenya 12-10 before they lost in the final 19-0 last evening. And the Kenya Lioness at the moment, we've seen a full transition. Uh, there seems to be a, you know, a transition. It's if you were to look at the side three, four years ago, it looks like it's now half those who are there and half who of younger players were coming in. Yeah, I think it's inevitable in, in terms of transitioning into players and it's important that we keep on, uh, especially the Kenya Lionesses where, you know, women's rugby is picking up, to keep on identifying younger players who, I mean, I mean the, the league, the women's league was played on, on Sunday. On Sunday, yes, yeah, in Nakuru. So, yes, yeah. in Nakuru. So there are lots of people coming through because of the amount of rugby that's been, in credit, that's been played, you know, in credit to the clubs and the structures around the women games, allowing them to play a lot and talented to become through. So I think now it has been a deliberate decision, you know, and, and the coach obviously hails from those areas and has worked with women for a long time. It's, it's important that we start uh, building these young players into the squad because as you've mentioned rightfully, you know, we've had a squad that have done us justice for the longest time. And the reason for that also is because they do not have too many tournaments to play. Uh -huh. All right, so you end up working with the same squad you know, for qualification, for the Olympics, and stuff like that. But now that their tournaments are becoming more consistent, all right, it means that we have to start introducing new players and building our pool, our base of players for the women to be able to, to, to feed into the national team. Because I believe there's talent. You know, I believe they're passionate about it and stuff like that. So now it's going to become more and more difficult to, you know, to maintain probably the same kind of players 
from that particular area, especially now that we're in 2021. You know, a lot of those players who've taken us through the last seven, five, seven, ten years, you know, and, and credit to them for bringing the sport to where it is. You know, but it's time that we keep on now working with, with, with fresh uh, blood in terms of young, talented players, while at the same time exposing them to many tournaments, you know, whether satellite and international. The unfortunate thing is that, you know, our mobility and, and the pandemic is not allowing us to do that. All right, so any opportunity means that we've got to take it. Now, and, you know, the, on the weekend of the 20th and 21st, playing yeah. against France, playing against the United States, playing against Russia, uh, playing against Spain, um, it was a really tough call mm -hmm. for the Lionesses, considering that all these teams are core in the Women's yes, World exactly. Series. And uh, for the Lionesses, when do they get to play? Um, and they get, they play Dubai, they're invited to France, uh, maybe Hong Kong when they're going for the qualifiers and the Africa Cup sevens, what else? I mean, how well yeah, I mean, the, do you see them play? Well, I mean, the, now that's, that's the harsh reality of sport. You know, once we found ourselves in that position and we've qualified for Olympics and we keep on inviting from Dubai, we are now in a position where, you know, once we're in that position and we want to be considered the best or to pit ourselves against the best, we have no excuses. Right, the opportunities are amazing, and it's a harsh reality because when you get into that level and you're playing against court team, you know, you know they've played tournaments in in Europe, they've played amongst themselves in the U.S. and stuff like that. So it makes it very difficult if you're not getting much fitness or if you're not playing consistently either within your region or within opposition where you've created like in a camp and say so you're always playing. So now we're in that position. What next? And that weekend, as you said. It was tough learning. Mm -hmm. You know what? If, if we want to go into the series, it means that we've got to play those particular teams day in, day out. And you saw they were absolutely ruthless. You know, they take no prisoners at that particular mm -hmm. level. And, and they were always going to try and have a balance between much fitness while executing their structures. Because those are teams that have been used to that. And you know we've played at this level. We can keep going and stuff like that. So we're in that position. What do we do next? There's a lot that needs to be done as well. And that, what, whatever needs to be done needs to be complemented by fixtures, by tournaments, because, you know, training all through without gauging where you are, you know, then it shows. So now we should start from there and say these were the results, you know, and, and, and credit to them, you know, they went out and, and they held their own. You know, you could see, you know, the Lionesses are now starting to, to show some levels. You know, they're not going, they may have lost all the games, but it's not embarrassing. All right? Yes. You know, it's not, it's not like, oh, you guys are lost the game. I mean, Kenya Sevens were there once before. We used to go and lose all <laughs> games on a weekend. Then we win one game, we win one game, and then slowly. So also, not that we want to be patient, but we also got to understand that this is, this is a starting point. And from there, we pick up the learnings and we move, as you'll rightfully mention, following the next weekend. I, I, will, I, will, I will pick out something that came out from the weekend, and this is because they were in, the teams were in a bubble when they were in Madrid, and that meant that every three or four days they had to take a PCR test, that's a test for coronavirus, and there were some false positives, but the United States team, the women's team specifically, decided that they were not going to participate as a cautionary measure. How much of an impact did that decision have overall on the tournament, Felix? Yeah, I think obviously when one, I mean, you don't want to see teams not participating, especially after traveling and training, especially for the players. You know, it's, it's really a tough, you really want to get out there, play and pitch yourself against these other teams. We're obviously playing within a pandemic and, and we understand that obviously sport, you know, it's one of those things that is obviously leading to the charge in terms of how we are managing this because we've got so many sports people playing. Obviously, the USA pulling out obviously then affected the format and we know the USA as a team obviously uh, a force to record within the series. So, so you want to have them in the tournament. And, 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 and though it's unfortunate they're not there, I mean, you've got to, player welfare obviously still comes at the forefront. You know, you've got to put, the, not the player, as, the, as we always say with the pandemic, it's not you as an individual, but it's about protecting others. You know, so they didn't want to say, so it actually affected the, the, the tournament. And I think it's tough on the, on, 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 on the players as well. But I think it was, you know, it was the right decision, you know, for the welfare and understanding of all the other teams that were participating. Now, it's, it's turning out that in this coronavirus times, the team manager is the most, is a very important cog as far as planning is concerned. From what you have seen and 
you know, <coughs> from the conversations you've had in the rugby circles, what are the biggest learning lessons when it comes to planning around these things? You know, having players in a bubble, uh, organizing for the coronavirus tests, ensuring that players stick to the regulations, and also ensuring that in playing conditions, everything is safe for them. Yeah, I think no one expected us to be faced <laughs> in this particular situation um, going forward. And, and, and obviously, it's been very, very challenging because it's, it's, it's a pandemic. Every little thing that you're doing, whether you're doing bubbles, whether you're doing player monitoring, contact tracing, and testing, it requires resources, you know, sometimes materialistic and sometimes financially. You know what, if you're going to do everything possible to keep your players safe, then you have to have all those things in place. So as you've mentioned, you know, your team managers and your doctors have now become you know, key cogs in ensuring that you're delivering your players safe and they're playing in a safe environment, including the environment, you know what, and the other team that they're playing. So they've become very, very key. And this has to be supported. Unfortunately, you cannot do that alone. You know, you have to be supported, you know, other than the guidelines, you know, by the resources you need to be able to test within certain times. When you're talking about a bubble, you know, there's obviously a cost implication to keeping players within a bubble. If we had the way we would keep players in a bubble like what they're doing, you know, in Europe and they do it with football and the Premier League. So you keep players away from home for the duration of three months, you know, and you only have a period where they go and spend time with, you know, with, with family. <clears throat> they come back, they're tested and everything like that. So it's becoming, it's, 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 it's a learning, but we've got to learn very, very fast. And I think a lot of stakeholders, I mean, whether it's from the Federation, the union, the players, you know, the Ministry of Health, a lot has to be done because you, we are learning every single day when they come back. And if we're going to replicate that locally, a lot needs to pay focus on that particular one. And overall, the same three things you talked, spoke about, Shuja, and now let me talk about the lioness. What to keep, what to improve, what to overhaul. Yeah, I think in, 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 in general, I think in terms of the players, you know, first of all, it's, 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 to be, it's to keep working with those players that, they've, that they had over there, you know, and, and, and look at areas to improve on those particular players. Main, 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 main thing is, is, is to keep, um, because even the lionesses, you know, we, we are starting to see a certain style. We know when we line break, you know, what we've, we've got the ability to either go to the very end. So we should continue, you know, trying to be, to take up the opportunities when we see the gap. You know, it means that we should be a bit more, you know, intelligent in terms of that. So that we should just keep, keep working with the players and, and, and ensuring them that they... Because we could see the spirit. Yes. The spirit of the Shuja and Lionesses coming out. You know, Kenya is always that, that team that brings a bit of excitement. And obviously the, the, the dancing after tries. We, we are the land of the lion. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so the excitement. When Kenya plays, there's excitement because you don't know what they're going to dance to. Uh, yeah, they did that <laughs> and then stuff. So that excitement, and because players should be enjoying themselves. So I think as a, as a team, um, that camaraderie and bond that's been created, that I've seen in both squads, needs to be maintained. In terms of uh, next was what to change? Improvement. Oh, improvement. I think, as I've mentioned, I mean, consistency in how we execute our basics. We just, we just keep on keep doing the same things, mm -hmm. you know, working on our passing, you know, working on our running lines working on our rack attack and defense and stuff like that. I think those particular things, because everything else then will fall in place. Because we always line break. We have opportunity with the ball in hand, you know, but just the little things, you know, uh, let us down. It's amazing at that level, if the best teams just consistently perform the basics right, you know, at that particular level. So I think that should be a focus as well. And if they do that, whether it's tackle, pass, run, catch, I think would be would be consistent and would now be knocking on the doors of being very consistent in Cup Chamio. The overhaul that needs to be done. I will I will not move away from from the offloads. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean I, the whole thing about flamboyance. It's it's good, mm -hmm. um, but you know you have to train. You have to train. I mean, uh, players make decisions when they're in space, the right kind of decision, and sometimes they work. And that's why I keep on saying no, knowing when not to offload because you will know when to offload. All right, because I think we find ourselves in very, very good spaces. You know, rather than offload, you know, maybe get ourselves in and out of that space and into a better position, either to create a platform or to give the ball. Because the women also, um, because people understand it, the, the opposition is. If I can't, if, if, if a Kenyan player line breaks and I'm slower, 
One, if, if they're about to be caught up, it's more than likely they're going to offload. So they start running within our lines. You know, then you offload and then the ball is turned over. You know. That is Felix Ocheng with his, you know, take on the Kenya Lioness who are in Madrid. They lost in the final of the second weekend, 19 points to nil to Russia last night. And also, the Kenya Cup is back and some teams already missing, you know, the Ngong Road gang, you know, Impala, oh Homeboys, <laughs> Nondis, <laughs> um, and also Mwamba for a club. And you've got to look at Mwamba, they actually are looking for a new home. And... First of all, uh, before I even get into how you know the play went down, your take on how would I describe it? I mean, the absence of these four teams. Yeah, I think as as mentioned, we we've talked about the new norm, okay? And and obviously we all wanted Kenya Cup to resume. Um, Kenya Cup has resumed under under different circumstances where there are a lot of factors to be considered. You know around the pandemic, mm -hmm. around COVID testing, around tracing, around hospitalization, you know, because that, that is obviously key. Now, when you drop down to the club level, it basically means now you're dealing with clubs have to take so much responsibility and plan for that. And 15s, you know, it's not like seven. So you're talking about 40, 50 players in training, right? And then you're going into fixtures. So I understand, you know, in terms of the four clubs that are missing, maybe they felt that they're not in a position, you know, to, to start going by their own protocols, all right? Maybe they also felt that it's not sufficient, the assurances that they're being given are not sufficient. So you cannot, because player welfare is put first. I'd like to remove, you know, the politics out of it. If Actually, I feel, you don't touch the politics. Yeah, if I feel that my players will not be safe, then it's a decision that they need to make because the club is responsible to those parents and friends and relatives of those particular people. So until they get to a point where they feel that they are ready or they feel that the protocols are in place, then so be it, then they will be able to come in. So that is my take on it because as, as clubs, Every club took a decision, you know, and said, okay, fine, we, will, we, we are happy with the resources and with the prescribes that one of Others said, we are not happy, so we'll, you know, we'll take a seat back and see until we feel that we're in a position to, or until we feel that we have enough resources to, to do that. So you cannot, you know, uh, blame them. We'd like all of them to be there, but um, it's a club decision. What's the ideal time to get, you know, a team ready for action in 15s rugby? I mean, you need, first of all, you need, I mean, a pre-season that, that obviously lasts not, not, le not less than eight weeks before, before you start uh, going into your match fitness and readiness. And I think another teams, other teams also may, may feel that are not ready, especially in terms of uh, their physical conditioning, that they do not have enough time to get their players ready to start the Kenya Cup this particular time. And that can be very, very, you have to be very, very cautious and cognizant of that particular fact. So two things may have happened, you know. First of all, obviously with the pandemic and sponsorship has pulled out, you know, you can't gather into training. It varies between different clubs who have been able to consistently keep their players in session and others who've been, you know, institutionally been able to, to keep their players going at that particular level. But from, from a leadership, from a club point of view, first of all, you go back to the drawing board, you say, how are we going to sustain just ensuring that we're able to get our players to train? How do we support them? How are they doing it before? You know, because the sport is still amateur. Remember, it's not yes. professional. Mm -hmm. so, so the clubs dig deep a lot just to get their players going. And kudos to the clubs that have been doing that. But the biggest factor for this one is, you know, most of the clubs felt that they were not ready from a strength and conditioning point of view or physically to be able to play now. Now, there was a baptism of fire for Masinde Muliro University of Science and Technology. They lost 56 nil to Cabra Sugar in the Kakamega Derby. Um, what kind of, you know, response should Masinde Muliro have? Because um, looking at the teams that are there, they'll have to play against KCB, they'll have to play against a uh, first rising Oilers side, they'll have to play against Strathmore and Blood. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, um, I mean, for the longest time, I mean, there's a time where, you know, the teams, when you get relegated, the teams that came up, you know, were able to hold their own. But over the past four or five years, I mean, once the relegation started, it's been more or less the same. You know, we saw a Kisumu side qualify for Kenya Cup, you know, and, and same, same kind of results. You know, so it's a case of you come up and you go down immediately because mm -hmm. when keeping up with, with that levels at the top requires more than just qualification. And we're seeing it now with Masinde Murillo, which is bound to happen because 
I mean, credit to Masinde Murillo for making it to Kenya Cup for the first time, you know, and they beat Mean Machine to, mm -hmm. to, to get there. So it's, so it's tough for these university sides, but it's also, I find it's a blessing that we're able to, to see university rugby now coming up because that is where the bed of young players are. They're able to keep them over a period. The successes of Mean Machine, Strathmore have been a good example of it. USAU had their moments as well. And, 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 and I'm urging those universities to keep those structures going. Now, for Masinde Muliro, it's going to be very, very tough because now they're, they're, they're gaining their learnings by playing. You know, when you thought, because they qualified, what, two, four, five, four weeks ago, three weeks ago? Two, three, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, so you can't really, pre can't really prepare with other teams in Kenya Cup that have been preparing for Kenya Cup and you are preparing to qualify. You know, so it also questions our, our, our technical structures at the university level. Are we preparing our players at that particular level in terms of strength, physical conditioning, to be able to withstand the physicality of Kenya Cup? Is there such a big divide between Kenya Cup and the championship? Oilers 39, Kenya Harlequin 13. Yeah. Yeah, that was an interesting score. I'll, I'll not say. <laughs> um, you can tell a queen when you see one. No, I'm, 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 I'm very neutral. But anyway, yeah, yeah I think uh, um, first of all, obviously, um, credit to Oilers. I mean, we've seen Oilers grow in the last uh, two years. They've been very consistent. I think their management has done very well to work with their players. We saw them through the sevens. And, and, and obviously this is uh, an, an example of, of the work that they've done, you know, so credit for where they are and, and, and what they've been doing. Obviously, uh, being a Harlequin is not the result you wanted to <laughs> see and because we, we're getting there. But as I mentioned, we haven't, the teams haven't played for, for, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and despite the fact that I'm not, I'm not giving any excuses, but I think we have to just give credit where it's due. You know, Oilers, you know, they went, they got there with a the win and everything. And it's for teams like Harley Queens and every other team that lost, you know, to, to go back to the drawing board and, and, and come back uh, next week with, with a posit more positive uh, attitude towards the game. All right, Felix Uchieng, former coach of the National Seven side team, Shu Jha speaking to us about rugby. And I want you to give a closing word. Impala 17-5 winners at the KRE Women's Festival, your closing word on this and the impact it's going to have going forward, especially that it's an Olympic year. I think um, on, on women's rugby, that is amazing, you know, in terms of them being able to play out. That, that, is, that is something that we, we encourage clubs to do. We encourage the federations to support and stakeholders, you know, and, and congratulations to those clubs that are pushing women's rugby because that is where the future is. And on, on Olympics, uh, generally, obviously, it's an interesting year as well. Um, heading into into the Olympics, we, we 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 we've seen a lot of traction with with the teams that have qualified. So it's it's exciting, you know, that we we are, we are, we are having a lots of teams. The spirit of going into the Olympics is 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 well true and alive um, going forward. And I think the teams have been doing well to prepare. So so, so for me, uh, part in short, you know, is just to keep 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 the faith, stay in the race as well, and, and, and wishing all those teams all the best in the preparation, and we do what we can in various positions to support them. It will be an exciting year. Felix Ocheng, he is a former coach of the Kenya Seven side, breaking us down everything to do about the Kenya Sevens. They were in Madrid for about three weeks and uh, played in two tournaments, the Madrid International on the weekend of the 20th and 21st, and this weekend that has just passed. And for Shuja, finishing second twice for the Kenya Lioness, playing in the final yesterday and eventually getting a win after seven straight losses. Thank you very much, Felix. Thank you very much we'll, for having me. Yes, we'll continue having the conversation about our national teams. We can see you're well labeled as Team Kenya. <laughs> we know you're involved going into an Olympic year. We'll be taking a short break and we get back. We'll be speaking about athletics because for Team Kenya, there has had to be some reorganization. They were to travel to Lome, Togo this week but that's not going to happen we'll be speaking with barnab korir who is a member of the athletics kenya executive committee about that and much more a short